There we go. Cool. All right. Well, today we are doing Romans 4, 1 through something. 1 through 12. That actually... All right, I will pray and we will get started. I think two times is sufficient. Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for these men, my brothers. Thank you for our ability to gather together, study your word, speak with you. Thank you that you are always with us so that we can come to you. God, I pray you would speak with us today. Bring out something significant in this reading and in our conversation. Pray this in your name. Amen. 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 All right. Abraham justified by faith. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. Now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. David says the, name, the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Is this the blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before, if it was not after, but before. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe, but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is also the father of the circumcised, who not only are circumcised, but also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Who else is up for a run through? I'll take a go. Okay. <clears throat> what then shall we say that Abraham, our ancestor according to the flesh has discovered regarding this matter. For if Abraham was declared righteous by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his pay is not credited due to grace, but due to obligation. obligation but to the one who does not work but believes in the one who declares the ungodly righteous his faith is credited as righteousness so even David himself speaks regarding the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one against whom the Lord will never count sin. 
Is this blessedness then for the circumcision or also for the uncircumcision? For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited to him? Was he circumcised at the time or not? No, he had not yet been cut. He was uncircumcised and he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised so that he would become the father of all those who believe but have never been circumcised. And they too could have righteousness credited to them. And he is also the father of the circumcised who are not only circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of faith that our father Abraham possessed when he was still uncircumcised. seven mm -hmm. says blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven if our lawless deeds and our sins have been given forgiven through Christ why do we have to stand in front of the judgment seat I think because it's justice. God is just. But our sins are forgiven. Indeed. That's the grace part, I guess. Or the, or the mercy, I guess. That's the mercy. Right. Well, you think about yesterday's reading, Yom Kippur. We saw that they do this annually, even today. And it's like annually they come before God, the Jewish people, or at least the high priest comes before God and says, are you going to do it again? Are you going to forgive us again? And he does so with some sort of expectation that yes, indeed, it's a massive reminder that yes, God is forgiving God. Yeah, but those are the Jews. We are right. Christians. Mm -hmm. And it says the Christians have to stand in front of the judgment seat. Where does it say that? I can't remember. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Let's look at it. Well, if you think about middle of chapter three end of chapter two there was a lot to do with like god doesn't show favoritism he's going to do this first for the jew then for the gentile and he'll do this first for the jew then the gentile and oh by the way and i feel like he might have touched on the judgment thing then too because there is like a a picture that yes all will stand before god. i think that even is scriptural that all will stand before God right. in the last days. Yeah, I just don't know where it is. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's a pretty accurate quote to wherever it is. There's <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5.10. Sword drill. Um... In, in no way 
corrupted, I mean the immoral people of this world, or the greedy and swindlers and idolaters, since you would then have to go out of the world. Oh, that was 1 Corinthians 5.10. <laughs> Oops. Second Corinthians says, For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may recompense for his deeds in the body, according to what has been done, oh. whether good or bad. Oh. And I have that underlined, so I'm glad you found it, Damon. Thank you. But I've often wondered about that. If if we're forgiven, why do we have to appear before the judgment seat? So that section is uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, is a paragraph in my Bible, and it the heading is living by faith not by sight it says for we know that if our earthly house the tent we live in is dismantled we have a building from God a house not built by human hands that is eternal in the heavens for this earthly house we groan because we desire to put on our heavenly dwelling if indeed after we have put on our heavenly house we will not be found naked for we groan while we are in this tent. That's interesting. He calls it a tent. He was a tent maker. For we groan while we are in this tent, since we are weighed down, because we do not want to be unclothed, but clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a down payment. Therefore, we are always full of courage, and we know that as long as we are alive here on earth, we are absent from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. Thus, we are full of courage and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So then, whether we are alive or away, we make it our ambition to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be paid back according to what he has done while in the body, whether good or evil. Huh. Romans 14, 10 through 12 also says, talks about this. Romans 14. I'll fast forward. Man, this is a long letter. It is. It's probably a scroll. It's delivered in scroll form. 14, 10 through 12. But who... But you who eat vegetables only, why do you judge your brother or sister? And you who eat everything, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow and every tongue will give praise to God. Therefore, each of us will give an account of himself to God. I throw this out, but I don't know if I'm out in left field or not. But if we're believers and we stand in front of the judgment seat, is it as, I call it simple, is it as simple as, Lord, I believe in you, and he smiles and says, go ahead and enter the kingdom, and the people that didn't or don't those are the ones that get reconciled to to hell but I I've often wondered that why do we stand in front of the judgment seat our sins are forgiven our sins are forgotten through Christ mm -hmm. I think it is kind of like that um former pastor at Res had a really cool uh, 
mental picture that he made regarding that which was yes we will all stand before God to be judged but when God looks at us he'll be like I can't see anything there's all this red stuff in the way Yeah, I've seen an illustration like that where God sees the unbelievers like that picture Damien showed us yesterday. But then the other picture was God looking through like a screen in the middle of Christ. Hmm. And on the other side of the screen there we were, you know, in our in our pure form because of the filter of, of Christ. Yeah, that's kind of how I pictured it. Like Jesus basically stands in front of us. And if we've accepted and received what he's done, then he's oh i've also heard it like he's like in a trial in a court like jesus is mm -hmm. is our lawyer and he's advocated for us god is the judge jesus is our trial um, defending attorney and god says what have you done and you lay out all the evidence this is what i did this is what i didn't do every decision every choice every action inaction all laid bare and drawn to account in the room in the courtroom before the judgment seat and then after that's all read out your lawyer says this one has believed in me And God looks at the lawyer, Jesus, and says, You have been forgiven of all of your crimes against me. I guess. That <laughs> moment. Come on in. Your sentence and I think, is forgiveness. I think the way this specific passage today covers that too is present, future, and past will be covered. Because he talks about Abraham before he was called. He lived in some Sumerian city making pots, I think, if I remember right. And then God says, come on, let's go. And oh, here's how I'm going to sanctify you via circumcision. You are now mine. But what this is covering, I think, is, yes, retroactively, we're also going to forgive all your previous stuff, and we're going to cover that in the blood of Jesus as well. Maybe for the first time this morning, it has clicked with me, you know, just because of this discussion that yeah we stand in front of the judgment seat but it doesn't take long because we're believers they say pass through mm -hmm. I guess I've always looked at it prior that we stand before the judgment seat and we have all that stuff listed off but it's the first time it's really clicked that it either doesn't happen or Christ says, I got it covered. You can go in anyway. And, and judgment in our case is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Yeah, I've yeah. wondered about that for years and years.
So what's the implication of that? You better accept Jesus. He's our only advocate in that courtroom. I feel like there is a picture that Paul somewhere writes, which is the mark of approval or the stamp or mark of a forgiveness or something like that. I need to look that up. I'd still, um, that notion of the judgment seat um, is interesting to me because because we've we've read about the mercy seat and Jesus was the mercy seat and the mercy seat was the the, the lid on the on the ark but what's the judgment seat in all of this? Well, I take that as being the seat that Father God sits in when you appear before him with Christ standing in front of you. That's how I picture it anyway. So there's... Huh. So if you if we're accurate, I've gotten a quite a quite a clarification this morning. a site that says there's four seats on which God will sit or sits right now and one is the teacher's seat that of the rabbi the mercy seat the ruler's seat where he's a king and the judgment seat where he's a judge The judge, so I, I did a query on this. So the difference between the mercy seat and the judgment seat is that the mercy seat was an Old Testament term, which referred to the lid of the Ark of the Covenant where the blood of atonement, the goat was sprinkled on the day of atonement. It's interesting, it was a goat. This act was a symbol of God's forgiveness of the sins of people of Israel and then in Christian theology, Jesus is the ultimate mercy seat. And the judgment seat is a New Testament concept, also referred to as the judgment seat of Christ, where believers are evaluated by Jesus Christ to receive rewards based on their faithfulness and service. This is not a judgment of salvation, but rather a judgment of works. It's a time when believers are rewarded for how they live their lives for Christ. Hmm. That's true. That does bring up the whole everything you have done. I even read it out loud last week, I think. But it's like everything you have done, all of your works, everything that counts as like credit to you will be try tried through fire and if it's burned up it's burned up and if it remains as like a precious metal or a jewel there's something to be said for that as well and then it, and then it final fin finishes with um woe is like woe is the man who finds that everything he has is burned up and 
all he comes away with is the smell of smoke. But gets through. But gets through. Whoa. <laughs> Uh, crowns of righteousness in Second Timothy four eight, Paul mentions a crown of righteousness which is laid up for him, and all who have loved Christ's appearing. Crown of life. In James one twelve and Revelation two ten. The crown of life is promised to those who endure trial and remain faithful. The crown of glory. Malachi 3.17 hints at a metaphor where the faithful are described as jewels in God's possession. And Paul in 1 Corinthians talks about the different materials symbol symbolizing the quality of believers' works and how they will be tested by fire at the judgment seat of Christ. Although not referred to as jewels, the precious materials like gold, silver, and costly stones can be seen symbolically akin to jewels. Can you go back to where you read that the judgment seat is a New Testament concept and reread that, please? Yeah. The judgment seat often, ref by the way, this is all chat GPT, of course, so probably need to fact check it, but it says the judgment seat often referred to as the judgment seat of Christ is a New Testament concept where believers are believed to be evaluated by Jesus Christ to receive rewards based on their faithfulness and service. And it calls out 2 Corinthians 5 and Romans 14. This is not a judgment of salvation, but rather a judgment of works. It's a time when believers are rewarded for how they live their lives for Christ. So I guess the context of those two readings, 2 Corinthians 5 and Romans 14, is people who are believers who've been saved in the evaluation the judgment seat of Christ is not whether or not they're coming into heaven it, it's it's an evaluation of that saved person's works in service to the kingdom while they were in their body okay hmm. Have to have to read that again. If while we were enemies, we were reconciled. So it's it's like there's like two courts, maybe, or two pr two um, two procedures, two proceedings, two proceedings in the in the court the first one is the 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 judgment and okay you're human you're fallen you're sinful you there's no way you know you you, you did not you did not meet the the requirement but because you believed it was accredited to you as righteousness, believed in Jesus, therefore come on in. And then you go to the second courtroom, <laughs> you have a second trial. On the second trial, Jesus sits, Jesus is now the judge. Mm -hmm. and, and everything you've done while you're a believer is laid out. And he basically rewards you for everything you did in service to the kingdom. Our recompense. And that's where, I guess, the whole thing of like, we're rewarded with new responsibilities and oversight of places and I guess in, in, in heaven, in this new heavenly kingdom like like Dylan's the mayor of heaven town and <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> kind of thing I want, I want to be a mayor <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's 
probably my only shot to get into politics. Is, <laughs> so I'm certainly not doing it here. <laughs> Have you, Dylan, did you, um, did you see the, or had you heard that um, they were, uh, they had like a booth set up or something at church to allow people to get involved with politics? Oh, yeah. Did, yeah, did, yeah. I do did, remember. Did, did you go check that Jonathan. out? Jonathan. I, I never saw it. I know I Jonathan was talking about it on the Wednesday series uh, back when it was still the Wednesday series. Mm-hmm. I think it's a really good idea. Yeah, he's he's totally right. Mm-hmm. The The concept is totally right. You know, if you're conservative leaning, conservatism oftentimes coincides with not being interested mm-hmm. in bureau- bureaucracy and the systems of government. They just, most, most conservatives prefer to operate the private sector and uh, take care of their family first and foremost. And the left-leaning people are more predisposed to wanting those positions is what I've found. Mm-hmm. So it's, I think the concept is right. It's like, if you want more representation, Uh, yeah, I just, I just think it's a good thing. Um, but no, I didn't see it. Um, I'm going to have to look into it, though. Um, so I have I have volunteered for uh, political stuff in the past, just doing doing photography. And that's that's pretty much it. But right. Uh, just talking with people. But I think you'd be uh, I yeah. think you'd be good at it. <clears throat> you, you, you seem to have a very. Um logical and just mind fairness well thank you i appreciate that it takes <laughs> being a politician is like ugh, who would want to do that it's hard i think it'd be really really hard oh yeah but i was thinking about this uh, there's a hierarchy there seems it seems like there's a hierarchy in heaven that's kind of where my mind was going. I mean, the, yeah. So th- that was a really interesting discussion about you know, ju- justification and the and the judgment seat. And Catholics have this the this conception of purgatory, where souls that are not um, that that still need to undergo some process of of cleansing are stuck. Um, there's the the three conceptions of the church, according to the Catholics, are the the heaven, mm-hmm. which is the church. So the, all three of church are the church, uh, heaven, purgatory, and earth. And heaven is the church perfected. Purgatory is the church suffering. It's like the that cl- whatever the cleansing process they call that suffering. S- and then sanctification. That, yeah. Hmm. You could probably think of it like that. I don't know. I'm, I'm not a theologian to explain this, all this stuff properly, but, and then the earth is the church militant. So that's where the spiritual Whoa. battle happens. Wow. And I thought that was a, isn't that a cool visceral picture? Wow. Heaven is church perfected. And hopefully I'm not purgatory. I should probably look this up so I'm not is giving the bad info. Church in sanctification process, and then Earth is church militant. You said yes, that one for sure. And I think heaven might be church triumphant in spiritual battle, something like that. Yeah, it's... spiritual battle. Wow. Yeah, church, church triumphant is heaven. Triumphant. But I mean, anyway, we don't have to. We don't have to get caught up in in this. I just thought. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, we're zoom again. There was. These, the, I had a priest tell me that. Uh, well, cr- Christian teaching is really hard to understand <laughs> if you can you can go so deep with these concepts 
but the way he contextualized it was I think I might have said this before but there's there's the two extremes like the, there's the black and white there's the hardcore principle and then there's um, the conflicting view on the other side and the call of Christians is to exist in that really uncomfortable gray area and try to do do what we can to parse out mm-hmm. the theology from that because I'm I'm totally on on uh, Dan's line of thinking. It's like, well, if this, then this doesn't make sense, and um, there seems to be a lot of contradiction if we take things at face value. Mm. You know, if we're right. forgiven, why, why, why? What's the utility of the judgment seat? Why do we? Why is that a thing? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's just another example of that. This this stuff is really difficult to process sometimes. Mm-hmm. Are they call it faith, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> it, if it was simple, then it wouldn't be a very good religion. Hmm. Because life life isn't simple. But then there's the dich- dichotomy of, of us of Jesus saying we should approach God as children in simplicity. So there's like even that is like <laughs> Like what? You know what I mean? It's hmm. complex, but mm-hmm. at the same time, it's simple. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's that's another one of the dogmas of the Catholic Church: um, the conception of God. On the one hand, um, like God, the existence of God can be known through the existence of the world and the beauty and the that everything just seems to make sense, and we can clearly see right and wrong because we're God's image. Yep. So in that sense, we can, we can establish, okay. And it's a lot, obviously a lot deeper than that, but we, we can know God through our, through our reason. But at the same time, God is completely, um, unintelligible to us. Yes. We can, we can, we can never understand fully what God is. All we can know is his existence and his role in our lives. And, um, we can take we can take that based on faith, and at the same time, God is simple, divine simplicity. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is which is often a uh, subject to debate between Protestants and Catholics. Divine simplicity, right? Hmm. So again, it's like these seemingly contradictory things. God is simple. Are, are just are coexisting, but beyond us isn't there a verse in the bible that says god something like uh, he's not it's not our job to not it's like something about we're not we're not to fully grasp god something like that um you know what I'm talking about? Who can know the mind of God? His thoughts are in, he's unsearchable. That was That's... fun to watch Daniel shift into research mode. Yeah, it was awesome. His whole, his whole physical changed instantly. <laughs> Ooh, oh, get this. Like an arrow bless, at a bless target. Your heart, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.16. Oh, same area. If you want to start at verse 11, that looks pretty cool, too. Go for it. For who knows a person's thoughts except that their, except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Holy Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness 
and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the spirit. The person with the spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments for who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. The and one... that, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. go and ahead. that, that, um, that, that quote, who has known the mind of Christ so as to instruct him, is actually a cross reference to Isaiah forty thirteen. The one who is spiritual discerns all things, yet he himself is understood by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord as so as to advise him? but we have the mind of Christ. Wow. That's interesting. So the spirit of God instructs us on spiritual things because it is the mind of God, the mind of Christ. I like this. I like this picture that it paints of his power and glory and majesty too, the one in Isaiah. What's it say? Isaiah forty twelve through 14. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? I'm gathering those are rhetorical questions. <laughs> I think I, I was thinking the exact same thing. Wow. Who taught the God of the universe how to do things? That's a good reminder. What's the context of that? Um, Why is Isaiah going into that? Comfort for God's people. That's the title that the NIV gives it. Gives the entire chapter. Hmm. Well, Ooh. gone a little over, but yes, we have. It's been an interesting conversation this morning, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any other things? Mm. Well, at some point, I don't have anything else for this time, but I do. I do want to find out more about. Um, Dylan, if you ended up going to the that mass yesterday, mm -hmm. I'd like to hear more about that. Maybe maybe afterwards or something, if you have time. Sure. Yeah, it was it was definitely interesting. It was like taking a step back mm -hmm. in time. Cool. Uh, yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, I'll pray and we'll wrap this part of it up and then if we want to continue <laughs> talking about Latin Catholic mass, we can. All right. Jesus, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for speaking with us, being a part of our conversation. I pray your blessing on all of us, yeah. on Dan, Damien, and Dylan, and myself, mm -hmm. on Sean, and Sean, mm -hmm. the Sean greater. Sean. <laughs> Sounds like a name of a band that I've heard of, <laughs> except it was Shane and Shane. Oh, God. I pray you would be with us today. Remind us of your constant presence. Remind us that everything we do should be done to you for your glory and for your approval. Speak to us throughout this day. 
guide us in your way. Thank you, Jesus. Pray this all in your name. Amen. Amen. Good discussion. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. You too. See you, Dan.